The beautiful island chain of Hawaii is known the world over for its magnificent scenery. But that could all change in a geologic instant. This paradise could be destroyed by the same mysterious force that created it, volcanic eruption. The eight main islands of Hawaii are home to 19 volcanoes. There have been more than 75 recorded eruptions in the last 200 years. The Hawaiian Islands are probably the best example of what geologists call a volcanic trail of a hot spot. They are formed by the passage of the Pacific tectonic plate over an exceptionally hot spot beneath the crust of the earth. And it's sort of analogous to if you had a slab of paraffin wax passing over a candle flame. Except that it's rock that's melting, not wax. Over time, this molten rock, or magma, rises 20 miles to the surface, creating and feeding the volcanoes above. Now, because the plates on the Earth's surface are moving, they actually move over this fixed hot spot, and that means that, uh, that new volcanoes are popping up all the time. Magma that reaches the surface is called lava. The lava collects and forms land. Each island of the Hawaiian chain, in fact, started as a volcano. As the path of the plate is followed from northwest to southeast, the volcanoes are larger, more densely situated, and far more active. The youngest of the islands is Hawaii, from which the chain takes its name. The so-called Big Island is twice as large as all of the other islands combined. It's not just one, but five volcanoes grown together. Kohala, Mauna Kea, Kualalai, Kilauea, and Mauna Loa. These five volcanoes are a dominating presence, forcing all of the residents to live in a circle on the perimeter of the island. Kohala last erupted 120,000 years ago, while Mauna Kea has been quiet for 4,000. Their especially long slumbers signal that an eruption from either is highly unlikely. But often overlooked is their sibling to the south. Hualalai is an underrated volcano in terms of its, uh, its danger and its hazard. One reason for that is it hasn't erupted in the time that most consider uh, historic. 1801 was the last time lava came out of Hualalai. That was you know, over 200 years ago. That eruption in 1801 produced almost 400 million cubic yards of extremely fluid, fast-moving lava flows. Molten rock covered nearly 75,000 acres of land and sea. This is an area equivalent to Manhattan, San Francisco, and Miami combined. An eruption similar to 1801 could be quite catastrophic. All along the flanks of Hualalai, you have a lot of uh, resorts and hotels, and the new airport, uh, the Kona Airport, is built right on the lava flow. If Hualalai were to erupt again, its impact could be devastatingly quick. It would not take very long for the lava to reach the sea, to reach the populated areas. In 1801, it took 35 minutes. Kilauea earned the title World's Safest Volcano for its stunning lava fountains and slow-moving flows that can be viewed from close proximity. The current eruption of Kilauea actually began in 1983. In fact, it's been erupting virtually continuously since that time. And it has now become the longest lasting eruption in historical time in Hawaii. But all that lava needs to go somewhere. The same slow flows that have carved some of the most stunning views on the island have also destroyed 181 houses and eight miles of highway since 1983. But Kilauea hides an even more dangerous secret. It is home to the biggest explosive eruptions in Hawaii's history. In 1790, there was an explosive eruption which accounts for most of the gravel-like surroundings that are, you can see in the field of view here. The cloud had to be somewhere in the vicinity of 28,000 to 30,000 feet. 
which had put it up akin to the eruption column of Mount St. Helens and looked just as dark and ugly as that. At least 80 Hawaiian warriors were killed instantly by asphyxiation and heat in the 1790 eruption, the highest death toll from any American volcano. Since then, Kilauea has claimed other victims. The most recent explosive eruption was 1924, and that one actually killed a photographer who got too close and was trying to film it. The same eruption threw boulders weighing several tons a distance of 3,000 feet. Volcanic ash shot two miles up and turned day into night in towns 25 miles away. What we have to remember is that we've still seen only a very small portion of what Kilauea can do. Yes, Kilauea can be very benign, but it can also be very dangerous under other circumstances. But of greater concern to officials is the enormous volcano to the west. Its name is Mauna Loa. Massive earthquakes have historically preceded every major eruption at Mauna Loa. Feared most is a repeat of what occurred in 1868. Little in the way of photos or illustrations exists, but early missionaries recorded well over 300 earthquakes in a span of four days. The largest of these is believed to have measured magnitude 8. By comparison, this quake was 11 times more powerful than the 1989 San Francisco and the 1994 Northridge quakes, both of which measured 6.9. It made it impossible for almost everybody on the south side of the island to stand during the earthquake. That earthquake induced a landslide and the landslide then came down as a giant mud flow and flowed into a valley and enveloped a small little enclave of people living in the valley, so they were smothered by the mud. But this was all just a prelude to the lava flow from Mauna Loa. The eruption started at about 5,000 feet and zoomed down to the ocean in a matter of two hours. 77 deaths were confirmed but this is likely well below the actual toll. The 1868 was a big one, a real big one. And this could happen again. I estimate that these events have a recurrence frequency of about 150 years or so. If so, we are due for another major eruption in the next 10 years. Lava from a smaller eruption in 1950 followed the exact same flow path. Rare footage of that event gives an idea of what a similar eruption might do today. If we had a repeat of something like the 1950 eruption, then almost certainly there would be many small communities that would be affected, many small subdivisions uh, that would be affected by that. In 1950, there was little in the way of resorts or housing developments. In fact, there were as many cattle as there were people. Had the island been more populated, the eruption could have been a true mega disaster. Well, the 1950 eruption of Mauna Loa was probably very, very spectacular. There was a fissure system that propagated and stayed open over a 15 kilometer length. Along the entire length, there was lava gushing out of the ground. The lava formed what is called a curtain of fire literally a wall of molten rock 600 feet high and two miles long. From the time that the eruption broke out, in about three hours' time, it was able to travel quite a few miles to approach the highway, and then, then it soon crossed the highway and actually went into the village and actually destroyed some houses. 35 minutes later, the flow entered the ocean, but it would continue on for 23 days and become the most voluminous eruption ever recorded in the island's history. Despite having the primary escape route, Highway 11, cut off, everyone reached safety. For some, it was a close call. Today, it might be a different story. Now, this was 1950, and the population of Hawaii was much, much smaller than it is now. So that if we have a recurrence of an eruption, the type that we had in 1950 from Mauna Loa, then there'll be certainly a lot more people at risk and threatened.
There's certainly a lot more property damage that, that cannot be avoided. The Big Island of today is much different from the one that was devastated by the events of 1868 and 1950. The once small port of Hilo is now the second largest city in the state of Hawaii and a major agricultural business hub. On the other side of the island, the relatively unpopulated Kona Coast has become home to billions of dollars worth of upscale properties and luxury resorts. I did a study that just looked really quickly, rudimentarily, at the economic impact just on properties. And if the properties were totally destroyed, all around the flanks of Mauna Loa, we're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 billion dollars. Major land collapse, simultaneous eruptions. The volcanic history of the Big Island shows that not only can anything happen, it most likely already has. The Big Island of Hawaii has been rocked by volcanic eruptions and earthquakes throughout its history. And scientific monitoring shows that these monsters still have plenty of life left in them. The earliest records were established by Polynesian settlers who arrived a thousand years ago. There was no written language up to 1811. So anything that you know about Hawaii prior to 1811, it's usually through folklore, through myths and stories, storytelling. There's even a goddess of the volcanoes, Goddess Pele. They attribute the eruptions to her temper. <laughs> Modern scientists believe many of these folk tales are loosely based on actual eruptions, but that they are unreliable. A more precise geologic record began when Western settlers first arrived in 1778. With the devastating earthquakes and eruption of 1868, Mauna Loa quickly became recognized as one of the most dangerous volcanoes on the island. Less than a million years old, an infant in geological terms, Mauna Loa has grown to almost 14,000 feet above sea level, making it the tallest active volcano on the planet. 60 miles wide at its widest point, its name translates as Long Mountain. Mauna Loa covers approximately 51% of the surface area of the island of Hawaii which makes Mauna Loa almost larger than all the other Hawaiian islands put together as far as surface area. Yet this is only a fraction of its total size. What most people don't appreciate is that this structure extends below sea level. So if you follow that to the sea floor and calculate the volume of that particular volcano, Mauna Loa, it is indeed by far the, the largest volcano in the world. The distance to the ocean floor adds another 14,000 feet. But there's even more. Mauna Loa protrudes an additional 26,000 feet into the Earth's crust. The mountain is actually pushing down on the ocean crust and causing it to sag under the weight of the mountain. The weight has even caused parts of the island to collapse into the sea. All Hawaiian volcanoes, in fact, have a tendency to fall apart uh, as they grow larger and larger. And Mauna Loa is no exception. It's had an, a number of large landslides where the volcano has, has failed catastrophically and released huge amounts of, of debris into the ocean. Alika II, the biggest of these landslides, occurred roughly 100,000 years ago. It's postulated that there was a large tsunami generated from all this material falling into the water. Though it's been greatly debated, the waves may have been strong enough to hit the coasts of both Japan and North America. If a similar event happened today, some scientists say 300-foot waves could drown Los Angeles in a matter of hours. However, such a collapse isn't expected for at least another 10,000 years. Events of this nature are so rare and happen so infrequently and it's almost mind-boggling to believe that a, a, a large, large piece of land can detach itself. 
If you happen to worry about lightning strikes, then you might worry about an Alika too. Volcanologists have their hands full just in studying Mauna Loa's eruptive history and accompanying earthquakes. Since a more detailed record began in 1832, Mauna Loa has erupted an astounding 39 more times. Most of Mauna Loa's eruptions in the last 150 years have begun at eruption sites, also called vents, near the volcano's remote cloud-covered summit. Well, most eruptions from Hawaiian volcanoes, and Mauna Loa included, usually start out with fissures that open up, and you get what we call just a curtain of fire as lava seems to fountain along a, a, a long stretch of fissure that can be miles long. Over time, this fissure tends to focus at a single point, and that's where most of the, the fountaining and activity is concentrated. The area around these fractures is called a rift zone, and it determines the direction the lava will flow. Whichever way that is, it's going to be fast, because Mauna Loa's steep slopes cause lava to travel as quickly as nine feet per second. In the last eruption of Mauna Loa in 1984, Mauna Loa was putting out one million cubic meters per hour. So things happen quickly. In that eruption, the lava flowed in a different direction than it had in 1868 and 1950. And the 1984 eruption erupted in the caldera before moving into the North Rift and sending lava flows down towards Hilo. They stopped several miles short of the town, but it was a reminder of the potential for lava to flow right into the, the largest city on the island. 16 square miles of land were paved with lava in just three weeks. Fortunately, most of the property buried by lava in 1984 was uninhabited land owned by the state. Had the eruption been bigger, it might have put 40,000 people in serious jeopardy. There's some radial vents on the north side of Mauna Loa that historically have sent lava down towards the Kohala coast, which is a, a very large resort area. And then anything along the south rift zone uh, could send lava into communities that are south of Kailua Kona. Uh, so the reason we worry about Mauna Loa so much is the potential to have eruptions that might affect many different portions of the island and uh, just about all of which are populated. But the 1984 event also demonstrated something just as disconcerting, that eruptions could come from more than one volcano at the same time. The 1984 eruption of, of Mauna Loa was noteworthy in sense that, yes, both Mauna Loa and, and Kilauea erupted. It's proof that literally anything can happen on the Big Island. It's all completely ridiculous. You could have a Mauna Loa, Kilauea, and Hualalai at the same time. It's possible. There's been at least $3 billion in property development just since 1984. And the tourist industry has exploded. Yet the main escape route for any eruption remains a single highway, which encircles the island. A major eruption would undoubtedly destroy the economy of the tiny island, not to mention the cost in human life. Well, the entire population of the big island is something on the order of 150,000 people, not counting tourists. Counting the tourists as well as the residents, we're talking in any given scenario, let's say thousands of people could be at risk. The volcanoes here pose innumerable dangers to residents and tourists alike. Earthquakes and eruptions aren't the only risks from these fiery beasts. Even relatively quiet volcanoes can injure and kill. When most people think of volcanoes, they imagine violent, explosive eruptions. Definitely not a potential vacation destination. Yet the Hawaii Volcanoes National Park on the Big Island is the single most popular tourist attraction in the state. 
Well, a lot of people come to Hawaii, uh, especially Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, expecting to see a Mount Rainier or Mount St. Helens-like volcano. And, and that's a common question. Where's the volcano? Well, one of them is Kilauea, which we're standing on now, and it appears very flat. But the other is Mauna Loa, which is this broad shield out here. And this is what dominates the big island of Hawaii. Uh, it's not a central peak like you might see at, uh, at, a, at a Cascade-style volcano, but instead has this very broad shield-like shape with a summit that we can't even see from here. The slow-moving yet voluminous flows help create the unique shape of the so-called shield volcanoes here. But the sluggishness also makes it possible for tourists to get up close and personal. Approximately two million visitors come to the park every year. Uh, we figure about a thousand visit the active eruption site a day. It is probably one of the few places in the world where a non-site is can observe eruptions safely under the right kinds of conditions. Another interesting feature of Kilauea eruption are these periodic very high lava fountains, or higher, very dramatic features that are a great attraction to tourists. And they can even see new land being formed. 560 acres have been created since 1983. Some people call them lava shells, other people call them lava deltas or lava benches. So a variety of names are used for these features. When the lava finally reaches the ocean after traveling for about, well, eight or nine miles from where it's first erupted, it forms these shells. But the beauty can be deceptive. More than 800 tourists a year are injured, even though the volcanoes are relatively inactive. The obvious dangers are you know, associated with the rugged environment you see. Daily, we're treating people for abrasions and lacerations. In the forest, people get lost. The, the forests and the surrounding areas around the craters are full of fissures and cracks um, that we've had rescues out of and so forth. Another threat that is underestimated is the danger people face when they wander out on a lava bench. People get out on the bench and it's made from brand new lava. And occasionally what will happen is rogue waves will splash onto this hot lava. Well, the lava is several hundreds of degrees centigrade and basically you'll be cooked like in a parboil. And so people have died from that cause. The odds are that nothing serious is going to happen to the average tourist during a brief trip to the island of Hawaii. But the 150,000 people who live here must deal with a variety of other hazards. Volcanic smog, or what we call VOG, is a natural occurring process from uh, Hawaiian volcanoes. In the case of Kilauea, which has been erupting for over 20 years now, if you were able to classify this as a man-made polluting source in America, Kilauea would be number one on that list. The high levels of sulfur dioxide in VOG has been linked to respiratory disorders and even heart troubles. Then there are the countless earthquakes that strike the island every year. Many are too small to be felt, but some can't be ignored. The October 15th earthquake, 2006, really was a wake-up call. We sustained damage somewhat severe in some areas along the Big Island. We had damage to buildings up here. We had damage to the roadway. There was a bridge here that was heavily damaged. And down along the Belt Highway over here, we had a section that the road busted out in front of a bridge. The State Department of Transportation estimated the damage to state roads and bridges alone to be about $20 million. Even on the island of Oahu, an hour away by plane, power was out for three days. The airport was closed down. The whole place came to a standstill. And this is pretty far. You don't expect an earthquake on the big island affecting Oahu to such an extent. The 2006 earthquake measured 6.7. But the earthquakes of 1868 reached a magnitude 8, 12 times more intense. Are we capable of dealing with an earthquake like that? I don't think that anybody is prepared to say that their structures can survive an 8.0 magnitude earthquake. And so if Oahu was blacked out, 
for two or three days because of this earthquake in Kiholo Bay at 6.7, I think, you know, there's going to be more wide-ranging effects and uh, the Big Island is going to bear the brunt of it. And such an occurrence could be the precursor to another major event, a volcanic eruption. The Hawaii Volcano Observatory is run by the United States Geological Survey, or USGS, to study and attempt to forecast future activity. The first sign of unrest that we might look for at a volcano is heightened earthquake activity. Perhaps something we call seismic tremor, which is essentially a, a constant earthquake where the shaking never really stops. And seismic tremor has always been uh, associated with magma moving. As the earthquake frequency increases, it becomes easier to determine when and where an eruption might occur. So we start with a few earthquakes per day, and then over weeks to months times, they may go to 10 earthquakes per day. And then finally, just before the outbreak, it's not impossible for us to get even in the thousands of earthquakes per day. But there's more to volcanoes than earthquakes. To gather as much data as possible, the USGS has literally wired up the island's volcanoes. So this is a telemetry mast for one of our tilt meters, which is buried in the ground. If the ground is tilting or changing shape, then there's a good chance magma is on the move below. Satellites send signals to GPS antennas like this one to measure ground level changes in yet another way. We have a network of these instruments on Mauna Loa and we measured over the last several years that Mauna Loa is inflating like a balloon. And that's an indication that magma is accumulating beneath the surface. And by measuring changes in the shape of that inflation and the rate, we can get an idea of how much magma there is and how fast it's accumulating within the volcano. The same accumulation shows up in this radar interferogram, a technique where radar is used to measure changes in topography. And this is Mauna Loa, the summit area right there. The color bands are representative of how much the ground is moving, and you can see there's quite a few color bands here around Mauna Loa. All of it comes together in this nerve center, where USGS officials can monitor all the activity as it happens. The methods range from high-tech to relatively simple. We have a couple of places on the island where we're actually getting real-time camera feeds from cameras that are positioned out in the field. You can actually see movies of the activity that's occurred, of fire fountaining, of, of piston events where lava levels rise and fall, of collapses at the coastline where whole sections of land fall into the ocean. This data is used to anticipate when an eruption might happen. Suddenly, many of these instruments would just start going, the signal would, would go exponential or uh, change drastically. But forecasting when a volcano might strike is only half the equation. The other part is anticipating what areas might be affected. Next, the hidden dangers lurking beneath some of the homes in paradise. effort to keep the Big Island of Hawaii safe from volcanic eruptions, scientists are working hard to determine what areas might be affected. Fortunately, history has a habit of repeating itself. The key to the future is to look to the past. And so, so far we've been able to map over 500 lava flows on Mauna Loa. Using little more than a hammer, a hand lens, and a field notebook, Geologists have mapped 30,000 years of eruptive flows and rift zones. And so we can use that now, that history, to look at the different sectors of the volcano and look at where eruptions have occurred, how frequently have they occurred, and from that we'll create hazards maps. And then hopefully those hazards maps will actually get used for something other than nice decorations on the wall or put into drawers. The USGS regularly makes recommendations to local planning boards on public safety issues. And so in a place that has high impact, you may not want to put a residential area, you may want to put macadamia nut trees or papaya trees so that when the eruption breaks up, a bunch of trees burn up instead of a bunch of people's homes. 
Unfortunately, as the population on the island has grown, the affordability and availability of land has gone down. The result has been the building of houses in higher risk areas. Buyers are informed of the potential danger when they purchase homes. Should Mauna Loa erupt, there are several communities we worry about a little bit more than others. Hawaiian Ocean View Estates lies on the southwest rift zone. It's located very high up on the side of the mountain. Therefore, there's a chance that if it was erupting, the lava could get into that community pretty quickly. The area known as Ocean View is built on top of the flows left behind by many of Mauna Loa's past eruptions, and it's home to more than 4,000 people. The challenge is that it's the lava historically in the site comes down a little bit quicker. There's a little bit less time, so it's going to require more timely and accurate information faster. We're going to have to respond faster. The problem is exacerbated by the fact that the area is serviced by only one highway, a two-lane road. So we know if there's an evacuation, given the time that we can warn these people, if it's relatively short, it's going to be hard pressed for these people to get out of the community and most likely travel to the south to evacuate that community. The highway is essentially the same that was destroyed in 1950. There are many areas of the island like Ocean View that are confronted with similar problems. The civil defense has a number of creative solutions to keep people safe. There are two sirens in the bottom half of the community which we can sound. The community has a great community education program and a community association. We meet with them pretty regularly so they know that if the siren sounds that there may be a need to evacuate that community. Hawaii County has the law enforcement officers we can do door-to-door -door with. We also have the county helicopters which could do a warning and broadcast a warning. We could utilize the Civil Air Patrol who has an airplane with a loudspeaker. We'd use every means at our disposal to get a timely warning to the people inside the community that it's time to evacuate and also where to go in the event evacuation became necessary. The key to success is teamwork. But no matter how well the system works, the goddess Pele always seems to be one step ahead. We're sort of at a disadvantage. Here we are on the surface, scratching around, and a lot about what we need to know is occurring, you know, miles below our feet. To fix this problem, the Hawaii Scientific Drilling Project decided to bring the depths of the earth up to ground level. So what you see here is a conventional drilling rig that we have modified to allow us to collect a continuous sequence of samples of lava flows that have been produced by one of Hawaii's typical volcanoes. Mauna Kea was chosen because of its age and relative inactivity. A specialized drill bit has reached more than 11,000 feet below. Groundwater centuries old actually helps to bring up hardened magma samples like these. This is really a sample of the eruptive products of Mauna Kea. Its age is something on the order of, of about 600,000 years. Ultimately, what we hope to do with the samples that we collect is to do detailed chemical analyses of those rocks. And ultimately, we would like to be able to infer something about other hotspot volcanoes. The project began in 1999. The goal is to someday reach the Earth's crust somewhere between 15 and 19,000 feet. This borehole currently is the deepest hole that's ever been drilled into an ocean island volcano. And as we have drilled, even in the first, say, three or 4,000 feet of drilling, we discovered a tremendous amount of new information about the history of Hawaiian volcanoes. Prior to the start of the project, everyone had assumed it's about a half a million years. What we've been able to show is that that's less than half of the life cycle of a Hawaiian volcano. It's proof that volcanoes such as Hualalai have much more life left in them than previously thought. In fact, the more that's discovered, the more it's clear how little we actually know about hotspot volcanoes. We had really some of the best people in the world most knowledgeable people in the world on volcanic processes, and we debated endlessly over what we would see when the borehole was drilled. Much of what we thought we knew about Hawaiian volcanoes turned out to be incorrect in some way. It's going to be a long time before we can accurately predict when the next major eruption will occur. 
do we have all the answers? Well, I think the answer to that question will be where I can come to the public and say, next year in 2008, well, a live volcano is going to erupt on Thursday at such and such time. We're nowhere even near that. The best Hawaiians can do is heed public official warnings and hope that there's something that can be done to prepare them. I think everyone needs to recognize that everything we've seen up to now is not the complete story, that these systems can behave in ways that we've never seen before, and clearly in some ways that could potentially be very dangerous. Whatever the next big eruption looks like, it will wreak havoc on this true island paradise. Earthquakes and power outages are just the beginning for the wildly unpredictable main event, a Hawaii mega eruption. It's happened before, and scientists know that it will happen again. The question is, when? A major volcanic eruption. Volcanic eruptions will occur in the next 50 years. Uh, a Mauna Loa eruption is almost a certainty within that time. Mauna Loa in historic times has never gone 50 years. In fact, it's never gone longer than 25 years without an eruption. We know it's going to happen. The best we can hope for is that it won't affect populated areas. While scientific monitoring may give us several weeks of warning before an eruption, history has shown that these mounds of fire and lava are anything but predictable. A 1975 eruption at Mauna Loa was preceded only by an earthquake two hours earlier. Hualalai has been silent for 200 years, but seismic activity reveals that it could reawaken any day now. Kilauea's current eruption is containable, but it doesn't always act as anticipated. Kilauea has this reputation of being a volcano that never explodes, but we've learned in recent years that Kilauea does explode. The simultaneous eruptions of Kilauea and Mauna Loa in 1984 raised even more destructive possibilities. There's no reason to say that Hualalai, Mauna Loa, and Kilauea couldn't erupt at the same time. There have been, on occasion, simultaneous eruptions. The probability is low, but we cannot exclude it. With this in mind, here is but one potential mega-disaster which scientists and emergency officials have theorized. 5 a.m., sometime in the near future at the height of tourist season. The small city of Kalua Kona is shaken from its slumber by a massive 7.0 earthquake emanating from the island's west coast. There is no other emergency, probably, that generates a certain level of fear than an earthquake. They're unforecastable. They come surprisingly. We know that we're going to have structural damage to roads. People's homes will shift off the foundation. There is damage which happens to buildings. The two-lane highway that encircles the island is broken apart in several spots, preventing travel along most of the west coast. The quake is also strong enough to interrupt power on the island as well as on nearby Oahu. The state civil defense opens shelters and coordinates efforts to assess damage by helicopter. Small aftershocks are felt for the next two days, raising concern among residents, especially since power is still out on most of the island. The dilemma with that is it affects radio's ability to broadcast, it affects our TV, so that, you know, it'll have an impact on our ability to communicate with the public. But the biggest concern is that all of the earthquakes may be signaling impending volcanic activity. Mauna Loa is the biggest concern just because of the massive area that it dominates. Eruptions could occur and send lava to most portions of this island. The tremors aren't emanating from the anticipated area around Mauna Loa. Instead, they appear to be originating farther north, beneath Hualalai. Hualalai is very much an active volcano although it has not erupted now for 200 years, but it has the potential of erupting again, clearly. Uh, it is not dead by any means. 
So most of the tourist resorts are on the west side of the island. So a reactivation or an eruption of Hualalai could be trouble. Then the seismographs at the Hawaii Volcano Observatory begin going haywire. Trouble is indeed brewing in Hualalai. Though most are too small to be felt, more than 700 earthquakes have been recorded. There are many people that live right on the flanks of the volcano. And if there is an eruption there, then lava could be pouring into people's yards uh, very soon after the eruption starts. The authorities make the decision to sound the alert sirens shortly before Hualalai wakes up from its 200-year slumber. Molten rock begins flowing to the coast. Within 35 minutes, the lava reaches the beachside resorts and Kona Airport. At any given time, there are an estimated 30,000 residents and tourists in the area. Most will be forced to evacuate. Many of these people will be able to return home in a few weeks. But thousands could come back to find all of their belongings buried under hardened lava. According to USGS studies, property damage alone could easily be in the hundreds of millions. But the tragedy may not be over yet. Due to underground shifting near Hualalai's deflating magma chambers, Mauna Loa begins swelling even further. Indications point to a possible lava outbreak in the southwest rift zone, the same origin of both the 1868 and 1950 eruptions. Mauna Loa's southwest rift comes down along the top of the mountain and does come into about 13% of Hawaiian Ocean View estates. It is inside the rift zone. History has proven that anything is possible when it comes to volcanoes. So USGS volcanologists decide to prepare for potential disaster. We would start getting ready to evacuate, setting up shelters, informing the community, going door to door with the police department if that's what became necessary, utilizing the helicopter and loudspeakers, the Civil Air Patrol and loudspeakers. The people attempt to leave the island, but it is difficult due to the road conditions. The ability to evacuate people in the event of an emergency is a challenge when you have infrastructure that is limited with only one highway. Then it gets worse. An 8.2 earthquake rips across the entire island. You can consider the roads on the big island severed. You can consider possibly loss of life if an earthquake of that magnitude happened here on the south flank. Aside from damage to just about every building on the island, the earthquake has also opened a fissure two miles long near the summit of Mauna Loa. Lava spews into the air, creating a wall of fire and begins speeding down the southwest flank. But unlike 1950, hundreds of homes, not a few isolated ranches, are permanently buried beneath several feet of lava while it incinerates its way down to the water. Death is an inevitability for some, as there is only a three-hour window of opportunity for escape. But the carnage still doesn't end. The lava and earthquakes will continue for weeks, destroying many farms on the southwest end of the island. With the destruction of homes, tourist resorts, and the agriculture industry, property damage could reach more than $10 billion. Building can begin again within a few months, though a full recovery may take years. The island has survived disaster before. The people here will likely adapt, just as the residents did in centuries past. When you live on the island that is a volcano, there's a natural tendency to be focused on that, to be a little bit more resilient, to keep your eyes and ears open a little bit, because you know there's always the potential of something happening. Anyone that moves to Hawaii cannot escape the culture, the ramifications that you live on a volcano.